Hello, and thanks for joining us on Chicago Tonight Black Voices. I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight, the lack of diversity in clinical trials and efforts to change that. And the family of Henrietta Lacks reaches a settlement over the use of her cells in medical research without her permission. Chicago's historic Bud Billiken Parade celebrates 94 years. A look at what to expect this year. I actually don't watch the news. And meet future storytellers changing the narrative about violence in their communities. All that coming up, but our first story tonight, the push to diversify clinical trials right after this. Chicago Tonight, Black Voices is made possible in part by Fifth Third Bank and by the support of these donors. At Fifth Third, we believe when diverse voices are heard and empowered, communities are made stronger, lives are made better, and the future holds greater promise for all. That's why we're proud to support Chicago Tonight Black Voices. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can drive change. Clinical trials are the way pharmaceutical companies and other healthcare researchers determine whether a new drug or treatment is safe. But only about 5% of people in the United States participate in clinical trials, and almost three quarters of those participants are white. There are several reasons for that lack of diversity among trial participants, but it can have life and death consequences for people of color. Joining us now to tell us more are Dr. Jekka Steinberg, a resident in the Obstetrics and Gynecology Department at Northwestern University's Feinberg School of Medicine. Dana Dornseif, founder of the Lazarex Cancer Foundation, which works to improve cancer outcomes for patients by providing greater access to clinical trials. And Kendall Whitlock, head of digital optimization, real world evidence clinical trials for Walgreens. Thanks to the three of you for joining us. Uh, Kendall Whitlock, I want to start with you, please. We know last year Walgreens announced that it was entering the clinical trials business in a move that would maybe completely disrupt the current model for how clinical trials are done. What are the biggest problems that you see in the way clinical trials are currently conducted that leads to this lack of diversity in participation? Brandis, thanks so much for the question and the opportunity to join everyone here this evening. So I think one of the biggest factors is that traditional clinical trials from the sponsor perspective may historically go back to the same locations and investigators and sites that have historically been used successfully in their trial recruitment efforts. But when they start to unpack those recruitment efforts and look at whether or not there is diversity in the population of patients who was recruited, uh, it paints another picture. And so by returning to the same sites, they get the same allotment of those who are geographically proximate to their own location. Uh, diversifying clinical trials comes through a variety of channels, but one of them is through the use of digital technologies. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw the use of telemedicine, for example, the shipment of investigational medical product to patients at their home, and patients elevating expectations that they would have options and the convenience and the access that they would have to health care, including clinical research. So I'll pause because I know we have limited time, but that's yeah, one of the yeah. <laughs> lots to talk about. And I know all of you can, can give a 30 minute presentation on it. Um, but <laughs> right. Kendall, I want to come back to you because the notorious Tuskegee experiments, we know of others. We're talking about Henrietta Lacks uh, later on in right. the show, often cited as the reasons why the black community does not trust the medical community reluctant to participate in clinical trials. Does that distrust remain a factor? What are the, the other issues that prevent uh, people of color and black people in particular from getting involved? Yeah, I think the short answer is Tuskegee is one in several of the barriers to participation in clinical trials. Yes, often cited even in the diversity plan guidance from FDA last year, but we know that there are 350 years of atrocities that were illustrated in Medical Apartheid, a book by Harriet Washington many years ago that illustrated that this issue is not only pervasive in African American communities, but in black and brown communities in the U.S. as well as globally. This is not something that only happened to one segment of society, but it has happened worldwide uh, for hundreds of years. So even in OBGYN, for example, we have statues in this country of J. Marion Sims celebrated as the father of, of gynecology, yet these experiments were done without anesthesia on slaves. And so some of those stories are told at Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner tables and passed down generation after generation. So if all that people know is the negative of the historic past, then they may not be open to learning what there is in place in terms of controls and protections for patients and participants in clinical trials. 
Dr. Steinberg, is bias among the actual researchers, whether you know conscious or not, um, does that factor into uh, having a, a clinical trial of, full of participants who are mostly white? Bias certainly factors into uh, the homogeneity among clinical trial participants. Uh, we know right now that part of the problem uh, that causes the lack of diversity in clinical trials is the lack of diversity among researchers. We need to promote and encourage and support diverse researchers and equip researchers with the tools to and cultural competency to recruit diverse participants and maintain their participation throughout clinical trials. Uh, bias training, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging training are first steps, but efforts need to be make, made on ev in every aspect of the research infrastructure and system to reduce bias and encourage participation of diverse participants. Dana Dornsife, your foundation aims to increase access and diversity in cancer clinical trials. Um, how did you become aware of the issue that access in clinical trials was a problem? Well, I started Lazarex 17 years ago based on a family situation with pancreatic cancer, and I immediately became familiar with the barriers to clinical trial participation. Um, for, for us, my family personally, it was knowledge. You know, we knew nothing about trials until I started looking into it. And then when I got my brother-in-law involved in a trial, I got to reach into my pocket every week to get him where he needed to go. And those two things really made a big impression on me because, you know, I, I had the time to be able to identify trial opportunities for my brother-in-law. And fortunately, my family was in a financial position to support him through that process. And that just really seemed kind of morally and fundamentally wrong to me that, you know, here Mike's family, you know, he got to benefit because his family was in that situation. And, and what do, do others do who, who aren't in that situation? So that was the basis behind Lazarex. And as we started to um, help patients identify trials and and provide financial assistance to them to cover the travel expense so they could actually get where they need to be and our network started to grow. Um, we had principal investigators and clinical research coordinators and social workers calling us and saying, hey, we really need you to help us fix this disconnect um, around our communities of color and their level of participation in clinical trials. And so we turned our focus to that in 2012 and really started, you know, trying to understand the, um, the, the, the other barriers, parameters, issues, social determinants of health, mm -hmm. you know, really get a, a grip on the whole picture so that we and could develop a place-based um, and culturally appropriate program to increase. Um, especially African-American black that, participation. And that lack of diversity, Dr. Steinberg, you know, in clinical trials, it can also lead to negative health consequences down the line. Explain that for us. Yeah, I think one example that really uh, summarizes exactly what you're talking about, that a lack of clinical trial diversity directly impacts health outcomes, uh, was demonstrated in the research of Dr. Kemi Dahl. Uh, she investigates uterine cancer, endometrial cancer. And the gold standard tool for diagnosing endometrial cancer was developed in research done predominantly with white participants. She identified that that gold standard, which is now used across the United States, is much less successful and much less accurate in black women. We know that black women are three times more likely to die of endometrial cancer than white women. This disparity is multifactorial, but part of what is a contributing factor is that our tools developed through this research uh, did not include diversity and did not account for their health. Seems like a, a good place to start, obviously, is in the research of, of the medication. Um, Dana Dornsife, what kind of assistance, and before we run out of time, does your foundation provide for patients who would like to participate in clinical trials? So we help patients navigate through their clinical trial options to identify trials that they could potentially qualify for. And if they need help with the out-of-pocket expenses, we do cover those travel expenses for the patient and a travel companion so they can get where they need to be when they need to be there and we we stick with them throughout their journey kendall whitlock we've got about 45 seconds if you would explain how walgreens aims to sort of completely disrupt the model uh for how clinical trials are conducted 
Well, I joined Walgreens a year ago, and it's the most exciting opportunity of my career. There are three service lines for the real-world evidence clinical trials business. The predominant theme is patient recruitment. We know that that is the lion's share of a budget, and that trial recruitment is often not successful. Sometimes trials have to stop because recruitment is poor. Uh, At-home trials, we learned during the pandemic that, again, The use of digital technologies enables telemedicine consultations. If you can make the convenience of the trial uh, relevant for the experience that a person has, transportation is a big issue for many people. And if you're trying to recruit people who have to take an average of two hours to get to a site, that may be the barrier to their participation. But if you can help them by either doing a virtual visit where it's warranted or by helping them with the transportation to a local site, such as a Walgreens, that is a better option for people. The third service and, and line is Kendall, real world evidence. Yes. Real world evidence, okay. <laughs> I'm glad you were able to get that third one in. We're yeah. actually out of time. Um, I know that you're okay. at the Black Women's Expo uh, right now working on this as well, uh, but we'll have to leave it there. We'll be Kendall Whitlock. About it for the next three days. <laughs> Absolutely. Kendall Whitlock, Dana Doran Seif, and Dr. Jekka Steinberg, thanks to the three of you for joining us. Thank and you. this weekend, Walgreens is hosting a health and wellness corner at the Black Women's Expo at McCormick Place to raise awareness and answer attendee questions regarding clinical trials. Up next, a settlement reached in the case of Henrietta Lacks. The family of Henrietta Lacks is settling a lawsuit with a biotech company that used her cells without her consent. In 1951, doctors took some of the black woman's cells before she died from cancer. Those cells kept living and scientists began reproducing them. Her cells sparked a scientific revolution and a multi-billion dollar industry. That story is documented in the 2010 best-selling book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, which a few years later became a movie starring Oprah Winfrey. In 2011, Phil Ponce sat down with the book's author, Rebecca Skloot. He asked her why Lax's family didn't find out until the 70s that their mother's cells were still alive. Well, it was standard practice to take cells from people without their knowledge and grow them. And really, in some ways, it still is today. I mean, it often happens. As long as your identity is removed from it, there's nothing that says, you know, if it was taken for some other purposes besides research, it can be used um, without people knowing. And that was really standard in the 70s. The reason that the family found out was because scientists decided that they wanted to do research on her kids in order to learn more about the cells. So her husband, who had a third grade education, didn't know what a cell was, got this phone call one day. And the way he understood it was essentially, we've got your wife, she's alive in a laboratory. You've been doing research on her for the last 25 years, and now we have to test your kids to see if they have cancer, which wasn't what the scientist said at all, but he didn't have any reference point. He thought maybe they'd had her in a cell, like a prison cell. That was the only kind of cell he'd ever heard of. Um, So her family got sucked into this world of research they didn't understand, and then soon found out that people were buying and selling the cells. And their response to that was then and is still now, you know, if our mother's cells were so important to medicine, why can't we afford to go to the doctor? And if people are buying and selling them, essentially, where's our cut? Uh, And in the book, you point out that they're justifiably proud of all the good that has come from the use of their mother's cells, and yet they feel feel that uh, somebody kind of bamboozled them. And it has to do in... In, in part because they're African-American, and give us the context for that. Yeah, absolutely. There's a long history of black people being used in research without consent. And here we're looking at a picture the of the United family. States. Go ahead. Um, and this dates back to the slavery era, but also, you know, at the time, in the 70s, when they heard about these cells, it, news had just hit of the famous Tuskegee syphilis studies, where hundreds of black men with syphilis were studied to see how syphilis kills you, and they were never offered treatment. Um, and there's just, there's a lot of mistrust in the African-American community because of this history. And, you know, and they were also dealing with a time, you know, Henrietta was seen in a colored ward, and she was, you know, her experience in the hospital was very different because she was black, so was her children's. And so they did, there was a lot of mistrust, there was a lot of anger, there was a lot of fear. They thought, you know, maybe did they give her cancer in order to study, grow these cells, or maybe they didn't treat her. Um, and they also worried about what was being done to them. Um, and so there was, there was a lot of fear, a lot of anger, a lot of mistrust, and then not it just, just kept going. And, not, and you also point out there was just a human reaction, yeah. like, 
my gosh, you say our mother is still, part of her is still alive? Why didn't we know what's being done to her? Is, yeah. is, is, is she being abused? She's right. being blasted into space and so forth. They initially didn't want to talk to you. How did yeah. you convince them to trust you? It took me about a year and a half to convince them to trust me, and a lot of it was sharing information with them. And by the time I came along, I didn't realize it, but I was one in a long line of people who'd come to them essentially wanting something from them, having to do with these cells. And this is particularly true of white people. And it had never worked out well for them. And, but yet, no, still no one had explained to them what a cell was. And it was clear to me that they really wanted to know. So I shared information with them. And, you know, and I think I also just didn't go away. And at a certain point, um, they, they decided that they wanted to go ahead and, and talk to me. But even as, after they did that, there was a lot. Periodically, they would get suspicious and think, you know, maybe Hopkins sent you to steal our cells, which... Johns Hopkins, the hospital that uh, she went right. to in the first place. Right. And, you know, out of context, that seems, sounds sort of almost crazy. But by the time I'd come along, things like that had happened. You know, people had tried to steal their mother's medical records because they thought they were with money. I mean, so their their story was really sort of almost too amazing to believe what had happened to them. In the first instance, was it wrong for doctors to have taken that dime-sized piece of tissue? It was you know, in the story of the Lax family and the things that have happened to them, that was the least ethically complicated moment in the story. Absolutely standard practice was happening to anyone who went to the hospital. Did, uh, would it have happened to a white woman? Yes, um, particularly if she'd been poor. And that's one of the things about the, the story. It's very much about race and class. Um, so a lot of research was done in what they called the public wards of hospitals where they treated people for free who couldn't get treatment elsewhere. So those were usually black people or poor people. Um, but even if you had money, in, if you went in certain hospitals, you would have had your cells taken. But you said that was sort of the least complicated yeah. part of it. What was, what was the more complicated part the of it? The more complicated part began with going back to her family and doing research on them. Um, that happened in the 70s at a time when we did know we you know in the 50s we didn't even have the term informed consent that idea didn't even exist but by the 70s it did and you know to go back to her family use them in research without explaining to them what was going on that was sort of a different story you know their medical records were released to the press and published which was not standard procedure so there were a lot of other and things and they were embarrassed about the medical records because uh, she had uh, syphilis and gonorrhea and so that was yeah. that was embarrassing to the family absolutely yeah mm -hmm. so uh, is this still happening today where tissues are taken without, you know, if, if, if I go in for a biopsy or anything and it comes back negative, who knows what's happened to that tissue? Is that right? To a degree, yes. Um, there are certain laws in place now. Um, if you go into the hospital, they can't take samples from you just for research without your permission, especially if your identity is attached. But if you go in for something else, you know, biopsy, blood tests, and your name is removed from them, and the tissues are just going to be discarded otherwise. Those can be saved and yeah, used right. to research without consent. And there's also nothing, no law requiring disclosure that anyone might make money off of those. So there, Even though people could make money off yeah, of them. Yeah, and there have been several cases up until very recently of people finding out years after the fact that their samples were stored and used in research. And, you know, I've talked to thousands of people about this. And Give me an example of somebody who's contacted you about this. Um, well, actually, just the day before yesterday, a woman um, reached out to me. Her son had cystic fibrosis and died um, many years ago. He, he was around in the 80s. And she found out long after he died that his cells were still alive and they were this very important product. And she had this incredibly emotional reaction. You know, my son's cells are still alive. And she was very pleased, like the Lax family, that they were doing good for research. But, you know, what I hear again and again from people is we know this research is important everybody wants this research to happen you know this is where our drugs come from it's where vaccines come from but they want to know and most people would say yes take my cells I'm not using them they just want transparency and honesty right. because right exactly because when you find out after the fact especially if money's involved people start to question you know well what else are you doing and it really harms trust I think and um, and it, so I think it often comes down to that um, is just wanting disclosure of what's going on and Henrietta Lacks cells have been used to develop the polio vaccine, AIDS research, advancements in cancer research, in vitro fertilization, and many other applications. The family's attorneys say they reached a confidential settlement with the biotech company Thermo Fisher Scientific earlier this week. Summer Mondays in Chicago often mean news outlets are covering some version of the same story. The weekend's violence. We recently spoke with some future media makers about their impressions of how violence is covered in their communities and how they plan to change it. 
They're part of Free Spirit Media, an organization that's been around for more than 20 years, working with young people on media arts and creative storytelling. Its home is now located, its new home is in Chicago's North Lawndale community. Many of the participants say the media is largely missing out on what that neighborhood really means to them. 19-year-old Jalea Davis says she's not one for watching local TV news. They don't show the love that we show and how we support each other in neighborhoods, how we help out, like how you walk down the street, people could just, you know, hey, how you doing, you know, talk to you. They don't show that part. Because of its coverage of violence. Because it's kind of traumatizing to look to before you go to sleep because once again, it's always shining on like the negative instead of like the positive what's going on. When you hear about Chicago, they always say about like the bad things. It's so much violence. And she's not alone. 24-year-old Nate Suggs points to a lack of context in mainstream media coverage. How you portray a subject in its fullness truly affects how someone can digest it, right? So I think that, again, we don't really contextualize um, the people who we define as perpetrators as victims. We don't understand how a lack of resources affects their decision making, how they have themselves been, you know, victimized by the system that, you know, they're trying to thrive in. They're both participants in Free Spirit Media a nonprofit that works with young people 11 to 25 years old from the west and south sides of Chicago. But that's, we don't have to really put that in like, our, like that's going to take a lot to edit. Staff here work to teach students to create media arts projects like short films and news stories to amplify their own voices. They're their own heroes. They can also be their own villains, but it's um, up to them to tell their own story. Uh, they have the means, especially in the age that we're existing in. So the first thing that I'll show you is kind of how I put these on for work. Today, they're receiving so, training from a Free Spirit alumnus, it. photographer Vashawn Jordan. Two Learning about the different types of cameras and the camera benefits, what's to look for in a camera. Um, how he started from this specific program, it gave me like hope that like uh, I could be anything. And learning to tell their own stories is how they plan to change the narrative. And I just want them to know like it's okay to be unique, be yourself. You don't have to be no one else. We all go through stuff. No one's perfect. Just really shine a light on it and get them advice. Creative Pathways director Candace Abioye also points to the need for stories about the community to come from the community to snap a complete picture. We have young people that are here that are, you know, walkable. They're down the street. It's like, but this is home for me. Like, and I'm not saying that some of this stuff doesn't happen, but it's like, nah, but that's that's my grandma's house or that's that's my school location. Like, so it's like, how does the news coverage again, get on the ground or let the young people who are already on the ground be able to tell those stories because they understand with the fresh eyes. The group hopes more Chicagoans and those outside the city can experience their community through the lens of young storytellers like Nate and Julia. I see like they always have like block club parties or giveaways like um, the school, they're actually still open and they just have like a barbecue with, like alumni that like graduated. So they have about giving back, but they don't show that. So you see the positive in yeah. your, your community. I actually experience it. That's yeah. the good part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Free Spirit Media partnered with partnered this summer with One Summer Chicago. That's of course the city's youth summer jobs program, providing professional development for interns working around the city. That program ended just today, but of course Free Spirit programming will resume in the fall. Believe it or not, the first day of school is just around the corner, and that means so is Chicago's historic Bud Billiken Parade. It is the largest African-American parade in the U.S., drawing in nearly 300,000 people and spanning almost three miles. That's according to the Chicago Defender Charities. This year's theme, Parading in Peace, block by block. Here's a preview. The community has let us know how excited they are to come out. This year, we have an amazing Grand Marshal, two-time Grammy award-winning poet laureate J. Ivey. So we're really excited about that. At the end of the parade, we it leads into Washington Park, where all of our sponsors, community organizations, um, everybody comes together to support our students, to prepare them to go back to school. 
So they get backpacks, there's free haircuts for the boys, free hair braiding for the girls, um, all kinds of school supplies, resources for families. So it's a family event. There's gonna be uh, entertainment. We have a stage there. So lots of good stuff happening. The South side and the West side coming together. We always have barbecue going up and down the street. There's four generations of families come together and I'm the fourth generation to run the organization. We are also working together with um, My Block, My Hood, My City, Jamal Cole. Um, and so that's why our theme this year is parading and peace block by block. And we just wanna let people know that, the, you know, what we're doing, we're celebrating and coming together. It's all about working together, families come together and peace in our community block by block. We were inspired by the whole My Block, it's inspired by the fact that we have to pay attention to what's going on in our community. And so we decided to come together. So year round, we're constantly working. And that's why we say Bud Billiken 365, because it really is that. As soon as we finish this parade, we're working on the next one. And this parade is Saturday, August 12th. It stretches down Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drive through the historic Bronzeville neighborhood into Washington Park. For more information, you can visit our website. And that's our show tonight. Be sure to check out WTTW.com slash news for the very latest from WTTW News. And if you're watching us on Friday night, know that you can also catch Black Voices and Latino Voices on Saturdays beginning at 6 p.m. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight Black Voices, I'm Brandis Friedman. Stay healthy and safe and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, and proud sponsor of programming that offers advice and strategies to enhance the physical and mental well-being of fellow legal practitioners in Illinois.